Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage H.W. Brands, Douglas Brinkley, and John Meacham with your moderator, Jeff Cohen. You know, today's panel is supposedly about the best U.S. presidents, but Actually, I think even more important for us today, we have with us the best presidential historians. Yeah. <laughs> and between them, I tried to count it up. I'm not sure if I'm quite right. Sometimes biographies are split, split between one or two people. But between you, I think you've written about eight different presidents. And uh, uh, It beats working for a living. <laughs> <laughs> you've overlapped on some of them. Uh, you've done, I guess, the most recent president actually but but we really you know between John Meacham and Douglas Brinkley and Bill Brands we really have three of America's great historians and I know you're seeing them at various times during this uh, amazing uh, festival of, of uh, writers and books uh, this has really become an ideas festival many of you have been coming for five years several people on the panel I think you know I know that Bill and Doug, this is your first time, John, it I is. think. But you'll be back. You get, uh, you get snared into this. And it's become a festival of ideas. And rather than just talking about who are the best presidents, I want to start with something else, which is, and maybe starting with you, John, and then going down the road. By the way, I should tell you, they have all at one time or another been among the people who <laughs> judge who are the best presidents. And Doug Brinkley is right now the head of the panel for CNN that decides who the best presidents are. So I think it's not an unfair, it's not an unfair question. What's the enforcement mechanism? <laughs> <laughs> to start by asking them, starting with John, what are the criteria? What do you look for in a great president? And what are the criteria which we should, by which you, we should judge a president who was a failure or who was really a disappointing president? Well, the person who would most hate this conversation is John Kennedy who uh, David Herbert Donald, the great Lincoln biographer, Charles Sumner biographer, uh, who wrote a book called Why the North Won the Civil War that's not popular where I live, uh, <laughs> uh, once c came in to see him because Donald was doing one of the early polls. Um, and uh, Kennedy had a bad day. Uh, and he sat down in the rocking chair and said, and pointed back at the desk in the Oval Office and said, no one, no one has a right to judge anyone who has sat at that desk until they have sat at that desk and seen what papers come across and what information they had when they were acting. And all three of you have done it. So there we are. Well, <laughs> President, yeah, that's an easy joke. Uh, yeah, yeah, we have. Uh, President Kennedy had other ways to enjoy himself. Um, but the, um, the, uh, <laughs> the, I think the test is to what extent do you meet the unforeseen? And when people run for president, they think they know what's going to happen. Right? They, they think they've, they've got their plans, in, in most cases. Uh, they've got their agenda. Uh, and there is a school of thought that your ability to impose your vision on the country uh, kind of a pre-existing vision is one, one standard. And I think that's true. I would consider that less a standard for greatness and more a basic requirement of the job. If you can't impose a vision, you probably shouldn't be running and, and winning. Uh, but to me, greatness comes when you deal with the unforeseen. And there's always the unforeseen. Uh, and my sense, in that, by that light, um, the usual suspects are, are among, among the greatest. Uh, Kennedy is among the greatest. Uh, if he had not managed the missile crisis well, we would probably not be here in this form, in this place. Uh, a hemispheric exchange of nuclear weapons in October 1962 might have cost 100 million lives. Uh, and he got through that. Um, Lincoln could foresee the Civil War, but he couldn't foresee what it would be like to, to, to run the war itself. And President Roosevelt, who's my personal favorite on this, uh, the second Roosevelt, uh, on the night he was sworn in, in 1933, and, and a brain truster came to him and said, Mr. President, I'm just praying you'll be a great president. 
And Roosevelt said, I'm just praying I won't be the last. Well, well let's say, you know, fascinating criteria. One, I want to ch test, see how Doug and Bill feel about this. But uh, by that criteria, a year in, Kennedy would not have met your standard. No, he would not have, but he was growing and evolving. One of the tragedies of Dallas, one of the tragedies of Ford's theater, is in both cases you had presidents who were self-evidently learning how to do the job. Kennedy was a very different president after the Bay of Pigs and after consulting with Dwight Eisenhower about what he'd gotten wrong to meet the crisis in, in October 32. But the reason for the, to, to challenge the premise a little bit, that's journalism as opposed to history. Uh, who won the week, who won the day is fascinating and we all do it, but ultimately that's not history. Uh, our mutual friend Michael Beschloss has a rule. It takes about 25 or 30 years before you can actually take, make a historical judgment about a president. And when you, th you think about the issues that dominate a given period that you can't quite remember anything about uh, a few years later, Quemoy and Matsu are my favorites. Uh, you know, two islands that dominated the 1960 election. I'm okay with whatever happened. Uh, <laughs> you know, don't know about y'all, but I think we're okay. Doug, what, what would you list, in, uh, including the question of how do you deal with an unforeseen crisis? Well, on uh, Kennedy, let me just say, after his first year, you know what's pretty amazing? He had almost an 80% public approval rating after his first year, even with the Bay of Pigs due to his May 25th, 1961 uh, moonshot call, which brought the country together, but also things like the Peace Corps and Alliance for Progress. So it doesn't mean he would have gotten reelected in 64. It was going to be tough for him because he was losing the, the South due to civil rights a lot. Uh, look, the big thing, guys, when we do the ranking of presidents, first off, every, the number one president by everybody is Abraham Lincoln because no matter how bad any other president thinks they had it, Lincoln had it worse. I mean, to come into Washington after winning in 1867, Southern states not even uh, voting on the ballot, you're not even on the ballot in seven Southern states being snuck in. I mean, today we talk about Dulles Airport, or you fly in there, that's where the first Battle of Bull Run approximately is, and the Confederates won it. And whether you're George W. Bush, favorite president was Lincoln. He would read Lincoln books all the time. Barack Obama began his career, um, you know, for politics at Springfield in the land of Lincoln. Uh, Nixon, during Watergate, used to get drunk and talk to the Lincoln portrait. And, uh, <laughs> The, the, theater, theater, the only Theodore problem, though, Theodore is Roosevelt. when the portrait spoke okay. back. <laughs> <laughs> well, Theodore, Theodore Roosevelt, our most Darwinian scientific president, his only occult experience was where he swears up and down that he saw the ghost of Lincoln in the White House. And if you go to Chicago, there's a bookstore, only Lincoln books. Uh, I'm just saying Lincoln's a very, very giant president. Then George Washington because of who he was, and he's our first, and usually you see Lincoln, Washington, and now there's almost consensus at number three is Franklin D. Roosevelt winning four terms and getting us through the Great Depression, World War II, and Theodore Roosevelt invariably comes in number four. After that, the numbers start switching after those. Truman goes usually pretty high, but, but in the more recent C-SPAN polls, the shocking this of the scholars is the rise of Dwight Eisenhower. He's going up quite a bit. Andrew Jackson, who's very popular in, um, with Donald Trump, obviously the portrait behind him, and he went to the Hermitage. And all. Jackson has some problems in the scholarly community right now. Um, so does Woodrow Wilson due to issues of, of in Jackson's case, Trail of Tears, and, um, and you know uh, issues on um, Woodrow Wilson for race. Which gets to the problem of, of polling. First off, guys, polls don't mean anything on presidents, how we rank them per se. It's really an exercise so President's Day means something besides being a shopping sale. You know, something we could at least have a conversation about some of the presidents. The bottom presidents, you never, I always say you never want to be below William Henry Harrison, who's president a month. <laughs> if you see yourself below Harrison like James Buchanan or something, you know you're in historical trouble. Um, but the problem where how we divide them, it's we'll, we'll judge them on how do they rank one to ten as commander-in-chief. 
as character, domestic policy, foreign policy. So somebody like Lyndon Johnson could get a 10 on domestic or a 9 where he could be 2 in foreign affairs. Um, and it gets jumbled, but today with races included, so it makes it harder. A lot of the earlier presidents get low. Obviously, the age of slavery, it's, you know, they might get a lower mark on that category, which drives their numbers down. So I think there's more of an upward look at um, more recent presidents that tend to do well. Ronald Reagan's doing well of recent presidents. Uh, and, um, and then I'll turn over to Bill. I, I, I'll, and Kennedy continues to do well. And public opinion polls, the public, not scholars, Kennedy and Reagan always do very well. And incidentally, they are the two most visited presidential libraries. And you think about them, both of them were great communicators. And they live in a sound, we live in a soundbite culture. Kennedy asks not, you know, what uh, you can do, you know, what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. Ronald Reagan, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. What is Bill Clinton's soundbite? I did not have sex with that woman, you know. And, 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 and that, it hurts. It hurts Clinton that we that we that are the visual imagery of some of the recent presidents. Bill, Bill, and Bill again. I want to go to what are the criteria? Not what's the not what what's the most popular by the public's ju judgment, but but in in your judgment as a historian and somebody who's thought about this, what do you look for? And what would you look for if you think of a new president? What are the elements that make somebody a great president? Sure. Well, first I have to comment on uh, the question that you asked Jeff asked of John and John's response about. Uh, and Kennedy's comment on the relation between presidents and historians who sit in judgment on them. Some insightful intellectual, probably historians, once said that even God cannot change history. Only historians can, <laughs> which is why he allows historians to exist. And actually, I agree with Doug a little bit. I have uh, ambivalent feelings about these presidential polls, and I do agree that they're kind of a make-work thing for presidential historians. And they, you know, they get us in the news every president's day. But in, in terms of the question of what makes a great president and um, you know, how do you tell and perhaps how would you predict whether somebody's going to be a great president? It is a striking thing about the great presidents that Doug just identified, the ones that are always the top of the list. And the top three are Lincoln, Washington, Franklin Roosevelt, Sometimes, Lincoln's almost always at the top, Washington, Franklin, Roosevelt, they sometimes shift a little bit. And one of the striking things about them, I'm going to leave aside Washington, and I think he sits in a different category, because when you are the first, you set precedent simply because you are the first. And especially if you're, you know, father of your country, then nobody, and I'll put it another way, no president since Washington, no president today, no president-elect in the future can aspire to be another Washington because there's only one first. But presidents do aspire to be another Lincoln, another Franklin Roosevelt, because they are often described as transformative presidents, presidents who've really left their mark on history. But here's the problem with that, and this is going to be uh, perhaps a, a paradoxical, if not sort of perverse sounding, criterion for presidential greatness. And that is you have to preside over a period of great crisis. Right. It is the crises that give presidents the opportunity to rise to the level of greatness. If Abraham Lincoln, well, I can't say if Abraham Lincoln had been elected in 1856, but if not for secession, Abraham Lincoln would not be considered a great president. It was the opportunity, it was the challenge, it was the requirement to take strong action, to hold the Union together, and as a byproduct, to end slavery that puts Lincoln right up there at the top, and he's going to stay at the top. It's hard to believe that there's something that has come along to make people going to change their minds about Abraham Lincoln. Whereas other presidents do suffer great changes in mind. Um, John Meacham knows very well that Andrew Jackson was the most popular president, the most popular American of a big chunk of the 19th century. More popular even than Abraham Lincoln, who wasn't very popular in the southern part of the country. But Andrew Jackson is a hard one to find fans of, perhaps outside the Oval Office these days, <laughs> because he comes out on the wrong side of Native American issues, on the wrong side of slavery. He's someone whose accomplishments in his day were absolutely essential. He's the president who ushered in the age of democracy. But it's an accomplishment that we today take for granted, as though, of course, democracy was going to come along. And therefore, we can focus on 
what in his day were considered venial sins, if sins at all. With Franklin Roosevelt, Franklin Roosevelt would not be considered a great president except for the dual crises of the Great Depression and World War II. The Great Depression gave him an opportunity to be the one to basically bring us the modern welfare state, to create this large role for the federal government in supporting ordinary people who have suffered reverses, in providing, well, Social Security, which is the model for other entitlements programs. But even there, that wouldn't have been enough if not for World War II, because I have this alternative history that I spin out, that if not for World War II, Franklin Roosevelt would not have been elected a third time. And if he had not been elected a third time, he might very well have been replaced by a Republican, someone who was opposed to the fundaments of the New Deal. Social Security, for example, was, for the first four years of its life, something you paid into and didn't get anything out of. It would have been as vulnerable to a Republican elected in 1940 as the Affordable Care Act is proving to be vulnerable to Republicans who are in office now. But World War II came along and made him, first of all, allowed him to become the, the vindicator of democracy in the world, the one who established the model of American world leadership. But it also provided certain ex post facto credibility and stability for the New Deal. If Roosevelt had left office at the beginning of 1941, the New Deal would have been seen largely as a failure because what people wanted out of the New Deal was an end to the Depression. It was spending on World War II that ended the Depression, and then people could back, look back and say, ah, the New Deal was this great success. So if you want to be a great president, you better confront a great crisis. Well, let's, Failing let's, that, you're not going to make the top three. Let, let's talk about that for a minute, because I think it's a really important point, a very important concept. I think one reason that the poster on Bill Clinton might be, I didn't have sex with that woman, was that there wasn't that kind of a crisis. I mean, you could say that during his administration, that's the only time we've had a budget surplus, a huge surplus under Bill Clinton, and many other things. You look at the level of income, and so many things all went up, and yet what you're remembering is, I didn't have sex with that woman. But Doug, how would you respond you know, to Bill's? People aren't going to the Clinton Library to see, uh, you know, uh, trade the pen you sign a, a trade bill with. They have to. They're looking for the hunk of the Berlin Wall, you know, that came down. And uh, one other thing with these ranking of presidents, it helps to get reelected. It helps to no. be a two a two it's, a two termer. It's a prerequisite. Now there are exceptions to the rule, and my friend John Meacham is, you know, and I want to. He occasionally blurbs my book, so I need to say something <laughs> nice about him. <laughs> nice about him here in public. He took George Herbert Walker Bush. Not only did he do a great talk today, but he wrote a brilliant biography of Forty One, who reminded us in his book that George Herbert Walker Bush oversaw the breakup of the Soviet U uh, Union. Uh, German reunification, the liberation of Kuwait, the apprehension of Noriega, uh, peace talks in Madrid, et cetera. It made us realize, wow, 41 was quite a foreign policy president. So getting a good book out like he did 41, I did that a little bit, but I didn't have the success of John uh, with Gerald Ford. I did one of those yeah. presidential series ones, and Ford was pretty low, but I kept thinking um, David McCullough and others believed that maybe Ford for what he did for our country, getting us out of Vietnam, pardoning Nixon, healing the nation. He was only in a short time, but maybe he gets a little bit of an upward revision. So what, who's your biographer matters? <laughs> so the, the, the blurbs are safe, so that's good. <laughs> Okay, I'm hitting them up for one in a couple months. That's right. why I've, I've greased the wheels here. In this illuminating and engaging conversation, yeah. comma, um, it's a must read. Um, uh, we just, we're done. Yeah, we're done. Um, I, yeah, yes, but um, you can also be, you can be a great, to be a great president, you need a great crisis, yes. You can also have a great crisis and screw it up. Oh, no question yeah. about that. And yeah. so my fellow Tennessean, Andrew Johnson, not so great. Um, despite the fact, you know, my best friend when I was in college was a guy from Lynchburg, Tennessee named Jack Daniels. And uh, <laughs> um, unfortunately, he was kind of Johnson's running mate. Uh, 
<laughs> so Johnson drank too much. He was confronted with the great crisis of Reconstruction and just messed it up at every turn. Uh, the two-term peacetime presidents. Uh, now, Bill Clinton can give you a long talk, which is redundant, uh, <laughs> about how two-term peacetime presidents mm -hmm. don't get the credit, right? Doug has heard this, I'm sure. Yeah, I've got to tell you. Um, so I, 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 He goes, I'm Theodore Roosevelt. I, they don't I, know that I'm like T.R. And he thinks he's Grant, <laughs> and he thinks he's, you know, it's Walter Mitty. Uh, so there's Grant, there's Eisenhower, uh, and the good news about history is, going to Doug's point about Eisenhower rising, is you, history can give credit where the present fails to do so. So we appreciate, in retrospect, it seems to me, and Eisenhower for managing the Cold War but not getting into a hot war in a way that perhaps we thought of Truman more, more heroically to some extent, although the president didn't. Um, distance gives you the opportunity to give someone, I think, a more proportionate report card. And that's not just because it's full employment for us, although I'm for that. Uh, but, you know, the, Bill talked about the, uh, you know, Jackson's fall, which is, which is absolutely classic. As late as Harry Truman, Truman was obsessed with Jackson. He had a kind of man crush on him. When uh, Truman was elected judge of Jackson County, Missouri, he drove over to the Hermitage because they were going to put a statue of Jackson in the courthouse square, and Truman wanted to get the size of Jackson's coat exactly right. So he went to the Hermitage and opened the closet and pulled it out and measured it. Uh, in 1936, lest it, 1937, lest anyone miss the point, that Franklin Roosevelt wanted to be seen as a modern day Jackson or Jefferson defeating Wall Street and Hamilton-ism, uh, due respect to musicals. Uh, he wanted, by the way, anyone who has rap musicals about any of our subjects will be out back afterwards because <laughs> yeah. we're, we're very much available. The Gerald, the Gerald Ford rap. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Pardon me. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but, um, we could actually probably do that. Yeah, no, <laughs> that's a good idea. That might be kind of fun. <laughs> Don't tell Susan. Uh, but I think the um, you've got to have a um, a moment where the historical record is, is also sorry. The historical record is also a reflection of what the present values most. So, oh, sorry, I was talking about 1937. Quickly, 1937. Uh, Franklin Roosevelt had the, the inaugural stand for his second inauguration, Bill would remember this, was a replica of Andrew Jackson's Hermitage on Pennsylvania Avenue. So just to make clear that he was, he was Jackson. As Bill said, Jackson can't get arrested right now. Uh, and that'll probably change again. Uh, Harry Truman left town with what, a 21% approval rating? Yeah, lowest in history. Uh, Worse than Nixon. He was kind of an early Nixon hater. And so you all may remember in the early 70s, there was Merle Miller's plain speaking. Mm -hmm. There was, remember the James Whitmore show, uh, mm -hmm. Give Him Hell, that toured. And there were all these quotes from Truman about Tricky Dick. And it resonated in real time because Nixon was busy being tricky. And it helped spike Truman's reputation. So these, these are fluctuating uh, historical derivatives. If yeah, I well can interject here on the, case take, of, oh, on the case of Truman, but this is one where we historians eventually get it right because what really caused Truman's reputation to soar was the American victory in the Cold War, which confirmed what Truman had said at the very beginning. The United States is going to win this struggle against the Soviet Union without fighting World War III. We will stick to our values, we will cultivate our allies, and we will outlast the Soviet Union. And that's exactly what happened. Now, it was good timing for Harry Truman, and Doug pointed to this, that Dave McCulloch's book on Truman came out just as Germany was reunifying. So if you got McCulloch on your side, and you got history on your side, then your approval rating is going to go nowhere but up. Can I ask you guys for a minute about, about uh, Woodrow Wilson? We had some of us heard last, last night, you know, from Scott Berg, one of the you know, great biographers who wrote the great biography of, of Woodrow Wilson. But Woodrow Wilson is so criticized for his racial policy that there was even a movement to take his name off of the Woodrow Wilson Institute of Princeton. Uh, 
Well, I, I think all three of them, maybe I'm wrong, but I think we all are trying to protect that president's names don't get ripped down and their statues get ripped down. Um, and uh, the problem that Wilson has is Donald Trump came in and everybody was talking about racism in Trump for all the reasons you know, recent remarks in, uh, in, uh, in Mexico, et cetera. So a lot of journalists were like looking who is the most racist president ever. And Andrew Johnson may be the winner of that sweepstakes, truly. But Woodrow Wilson starts hanging in there and you start seeing, you know, yet you know like Theodore Roosevelt had a different, you're just not feeling the racism even though all of these presidents had some quite like Johnson and Woodrow Wilson, yet Wilson was our great commander in chief. One World War One, uh, it, it created Wilsonianism and in many ways a celebrated figure, but he's not, uh, He's not tracking well, um, and also the neo-Wilsonian neo movement of making the world safe for democracy seem to have crumbled in Iraq, that we can go in and build everywhere. And so Wilson's stock is kind of down now, but does that mean Princeton should do away with the Woodrow Wilson School? No. Does it mean, well, you know, Wilson, there's so much greatness to him, but he had, the, you know, when you're showing Birth of a Nation in the White House and you're celebrating the KKK, in a multicultural America of today, you're going to take some hits. And, he cl and the Espionage Act. Yeah. I mean, he shut down 400 publications that he didn't agree with. Uh, we had the, the Red Scare on his watch. And also, if you want to be really dorky about it, and let's face it, you're here, so yeah. you probably <laughs> did. Um, <laughs> this is like the world's largest meeting of nerds anonymous. Yeah. <laughs> um, you've got a... Uh, You've got a president who governed, so to speak, or was in power for a year and five months without really being able to govern. He suffered a stroke on October 2nd, 1919, and was basically incapable of being president until he left office. And w there's also been talk recently of the 25th Amendment for various reasons. I'll let you fill in the blanks. Uh, but part of the inspiration for that was we can't have this again. So you do have to look at, um, yes, there's World War I, but when I mean, you take a yeah. step back and look at all eight years, it, it's, a, it's a very and mixed the, the Treaty of Versailles, you know, crumbled, obviously, with German, Germany just disregarding it in so many ways, and then the League of Nations not having American entrance, entry in it. Wilson had a slight renaissance during World War II when a movie came out called yeah. On Wilson. And FDR kind of got behind Wilson in his thinking about the building of the United Nations, and he had a kind of up moment, but it's slid quite a bit. The reason lately it's been talked about is because of the 100th anniversary of World War I. So, right. And Scott wrote a great, Berg wrote a great book. If you want to read a book on Wilson, read Scott Berg. L let me throw somebody else out, and because you're, uh, so we can get some blurbs, early blurbs for you, John. <laughs> uh, you're doing a, a, a book now about James Madison. Right. Of course, Madison, we think of as a great man in large part because of what he did before he became president. Yeah, I, and that, thankfully that gives me a day job because um, I, I disagree. Uh, I mean, he, you know, writing the Constitution, check. Um, not, a, <laughs> not a bad line for the obit. Um, so, uh, so, yes, creating the Constitution, creating the party system, um, having the good sense to marry Dolly um, was all, all, all there. But he was, um, part of my goal, uh, and I think all of us would share this uh, as a mission, is Madison has almost, plays almost no role in our imagination, right? Intellectually, we know, we know it, we appreciate the checks and balances, we know Federalist 10, all yeah. of that. But even in the late 18th century, early 19th century, to be at the pinnacle of national politics, even though the world was much smaller and the, the arena was smaller, it was still a ferocious arena. You know, if, if, if you doubt it, you know, Shakespeare's history plays tell us a lot about this. Um, so for someone to have been at the top of American political life, even in a seemingly simpler time, although I'd argue that creating a republic over a span, expanse of country this big is actually, as it was then, is, is quite different. To have been Secretary of State, would have been the first Speaker of the functionally the first Majority Leader of the House, to have been Secretary of State, to have won two national elections, required a, a certain political ambition and, and an ability to project a personality 
that we don't often associate with them. I haven't quite cracked the code yet, but I'll, I'll come back and explain <laughs> it. Bill, I want to ask you about another president you've helped to reestablish, and now uh, uh, Carlos will be taking a whole other step. But you know, Ulysses S. Grant, whose name was mentioned up here, was for a long time not considered such a strong president. How, how do you see him, and where does he fit in his lexicon? Ulysses Grant is never going to make the top ten of great presidents. But that was not because he lacked the talent, but because he was president during Reconstruction. There, was n there has never been a more difficult time to be president. It was Abraham Lincoln's personal tragedy, but historical good fortune to be assassinated at the end of the war because he didn't have to deal with the aftermath of the war. One of the reasons I wrote about Ulysses Grant was he allowed me to examine a fundamental fact about democracy, especially American democracy, and that is it's a whole lot easier to get things done. It's a whole lot easier to govern during wartime than it is during peacetime. War allows you to do things you can't do during peacetime. Now, of course, Grant was not president during the war. Abraham Lincoln was. But to give you one example, the American Republic could not figure out what to do with slavery during the 70 years from the ratification of the Constitution in 1789 and the Civil War. You could not figure out how to square the circle of republicanism, the idea that political power emanates from the people, and that, in the words of the Declaration of Independence, all men are created equal, and slavery. So you couldn't fit the two together, and members of Congress, presidents, beat their heads against each other, beat them against the wall, trying to do something about this. So 70 years, and the problem cannot be resolved. In two years during the war, it was resolved. Lincoln could, sort of metaphorically and literally, cut the Gordian knot of slavery because as commander in chief you can do these things. Well, all that power, all that ability to change the country, to bring the South back into the Union, dissolves when the war ends. And so Grant is someone who has to deal with that and he has to oversee the transition from wartime power in the, in the executive to peacetime, well, lack of power, and because it, most of it fades away, but also, and this is the fundamental problem that every president deals with, you know, how do you persuade people? When you're in the middle of a war, you can use the tools of coercion. When the country is at peace, you have to, you have to rely on persuasion, and people are hard to persuade, especially when something has happened to them, as happened to Southerners, that they didn't like at all, and they weren't buying into they could be forced to accede to the wishes of the government in Washington as long as the war was on. When the war ended, then they reasserted their ability and their right under the U.S. federal constitution to govern things their own way. And Grant was the one primarily who had to deal with that, and he understood that it was a losing battle. He realized that he could not force white Southerners, who remained the majority and who eventually would regain power, to basically honor the principles of Abraham Lincoln and the, the racial egalitarian of the war. Um, and he watched it sort of go away while he was president. I'm not going to say he left office feeling defeated. I will say this, though, that I think Grant was a much better president than he's often been given credit for being. He very often was right down there with James Buchanan in those polls. He had good intentions, but the good intentions in this case were defeated by a hard reality. Can Doug, you you've, say, you've yeah. lived with, with Richard Nixon a lot. And <laughs> Do we have to go to Nixon? <laughs> well, I think, I think we should because yeah. Nixon, in a way, was the best of times and the worst of times. And, and I'm curious both how you evaluate him, but also are we reevaluating him as a country now? Well, just briefly on what Bill said about Grant, if I could, he wrote the great Civil War memoir, yeah. Grant. Yeah, he did. And yeah. I saw President Obama over Christmas, and he's writing his memoir, and he has read grants, but it doesn't cover the presidency. And then he looked at all the other presidential memoirs, and Obama doesn't think they're any good. He's like a writer, and he wants it to be good. So he's starting to look at Atchison and Kennan and things like that to do the, the good book. I'm from Ohio, as I mentioned earlier today, and we have seven presidents we claim from there. And I tried to do a presidential library for the Ohio presidents in Columbus. I went to the Ohio State, and they stole Grant from me. That Mississippi <coughs> has built a right. Grant Museum, even though he was born in Ohio. Yeah. So when you took Grant out of my deck, I was left with Warren Harding and, you know, 
Garfield and all that. And well, could, could Carl Rove help you? Yeah. <laughs> and well, well, Carl's McKinley. a about this. With McKinley. And, and, uh, yeah, he is with McKinley. Um, Nixon, guys, is always going to be doomed to be ranked pretty low because of the tapes he left behind. Uh, I edited the Nixon tapes with a fellow uh, Luke Nichter, a scholar, and they are just the racial slurs, the anti-Semitism, that it's um, the, the nuttiness, the bomb, the bejesus out of everybody hurts Nixon. Uh, what helps Nixon is he has some accomplishments like all these presidents, his 1972 trip to China and what that means. Even though he thought it was a negative, he created the Environmental Protection Agency, <laughs> clean air and water, you know. You can find some accomplishments with Nixon, but usually he's remembered for the dark, a dark side of Achilles' heel, the enemy's list, Watergate. And how do you get the albatross of Watergate from around your neck? So Nixon's never going to skyrocket very hard. But Trump um, loves Nixon. I got to talk to Trump at Mar-a-Lago a year ago, and his whole, I asked him about all the different president, and Nixon's his man. That's not reassuring. Yeah. <laughs> he liked Nixon because he was on the Phil, uh, he, his wife, Pat Nixon, saw Trump on the Phil Donahue show and wrote, a letter, Nixon writes Donald Trump, my wife said you could be president, you're magnificent. He'll share this letter. Oh, Trump. yeah. And, yeah and, uh, and that, you know, uh, and so they started dining. And I asked Pres uh, Trump, I said, well, why did you stop? When, how long did you dine? He said a number of times. And I said, what stopped? He said, he had bad table manners. I swear to you, Nixon uh. did. He said, I just didn't enjoy the way he talked to the help in restaurants and things. And it was... Uh, Roy Cohen's a big link a figure you hear a lot between uh, Nixon and Donald Trump, but you don't want to be in history like Ni so. you don't want to be Nixon in history. Um, it's hard to rehabilitate. So, so one of the things you've touched on, I'd like to ask all three of you about, is character. And uh, Sean Willens, who's another major historian, did a piece, a, a column recently yep. in the New York Times, where he argued, and I'd say in a different way. Uh, uh, Brett Stevens, in his, Brett Stevens, in his own way, wrote something similar to this: that whatever accomplishments a president has, if their character is mm -hmm. bad in terms of contaminating the country, in terms of leading us in a really bad direction, and so forth, it can overcome those accomplishments. I'd love to know how each of you think of that. You can, of course, talk about the incumbent if you want, the president incumbent, or just in general terms, John. Uh, a <coughs> month after, a week after. Uh, Franklin Roosevelt won in 1932. The New York Times asked him for a definition of the presidency. And it's, it read, they ran at the bottom of a profile page about him. Uh, no byline, it just says Roosevelt on the presidency. And it's the source of his great observation that the presidency is not uh, merely an engineering job. Who is he talking about there? <laughs> you know, he'd already <laughs> beaten Hoover, so he, he's spiking the ball a bit. But he said that it is preeminently a place of moral leadership. And he says, great presidents have come along in times of the life of the nation when large ideas needed to be clarified. And in his view, and this was like Lincoln, uh, like Jackson, like Jefferson, um, he would have thought like Wilson. And he envisioned himself too. Presidents, one of the things to watch out for is whenever presidents talk about other presidents, my experience of it is they see as they wish to be seen and they're almost always talking about themselves yeah, uh, in some way, right? So everyone you know, looks back and, and, and tries to find sanction. Um, but FDR's view of the, the office as preeminently a place of moral leadership, I think is true. Um, I think this conversation, mind you, of the past half hour or so, would have horrified most of the founders who didn't want us talking about presidents all the time because they didn't want them to be the dominant figure. Why is it Article 2 of the Constitution? Because they were seeing a world where the will of the people would be more accurately reflected and filtered and acted upon through the legislature. And so the rise of what the scholars call presidential war, uh, obviously the, the, the nuclear age has changed this, this radically. But it's unquestionable that Presidents affect manners and morals. Uh, there's a line at the end of Henry V that uh, Kate, who the French princess whom Henry V is wooing, says, but it's not the manner to, I'm, I don't know your manners. 
uh, in England, and he says, Kate, Kate, we shall be the makers of manners. Hmm. And that's essentially what the presidency has, has become. It would have horrified the founders, but it's practically true. Uh, I have a 15-year-old who watched the rise of Trump for Oedipal reasons. He had not been interested in politics or history uh, for until then, but he spent time around the bushes. He just looked at this and said, this is not tenable. I don't know if that's the word he used. Uh, and is now daily horrified. This is a 50, uh, when you're horrifying an adolescent boy, <laughs> Jesus. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> So I, I, don't know what, I don't know where it's going to end up. I think the culture is coarser than it was 18 months ago. But my final point here, and I'll, I'll pass on to the wiser heads, is one of the things also about presidents is they are political creatures. And therefore, we play an enormous role in this. They are going to lead within the constraints of the possible. And who sets the constraints of the possible? But opinion of the public. If they think they can pass something, they're going to they're going to do it, but we have to be for it. So simply to whine about the people who are there uh, or throw up our hands is really not a sufficient exercise it seems to me of our part of the covenant. Sir, um, I agree with anything John just said, but also I'd add like the 1800 election was pretty brutal and they started becoming a cult of George Washington. It's when you had Parson Weems books and why we yeah. name our capital after Washington and everything became Washington. I'm interested in uh, what I like about his James Madison book, why it's gonna be a big book, is he's got Dolly Madison, a first lady, we haven't talked about them today, but Eleanor Roosevelt wrote a lot. Oh, yeah. And it helps FDR's legacy, Eleanor Roosevelt, cause she wrote My Day columns and there, you know, you could footnote her Dolly Madison's a writer, and John uh, uh, David McCullough did great with Abigail and John Adams because there were writing presents. Polk, another Tennessean, um, he wrote, he kept diaries. Um, uh, Ronald Reagan, I edited Ronald Reagan's diaries, and I had helped Reagan's legacy only to the degree that people said, wow, he was saying all these interesting things. And so the leavings, what does a president leave? And Theodore Roosevelt wrote all the time, 35 <laughs> books and 150,000 letters. I don't know if you guys know, Bill Brands wrote a biography traitor to our class on FDR and a biography of TR. And we once had lunch down in Austin and he, we were talking about both Roosevelt's and we both commiserated how easy it is to write about Theodore because of the letters. You can footnote it. He writes and writes and writes and writes. FDR was like, I don't let my left hand know what my right hand's doing. I'm yeah. a juggler. Don't put it in writing. And so it's a little harder to get to who, uh, who FDR is in some ways than it was TR because he left so many leavings, writings. I don't know in this age of email what we're getting, but we're getting a lot of tweets. <laughs> there will be the collected tweets of Donald Trump someday and they'll all be annotated and footnoted. It's a massive project of it because that's the new form of communication. But in the old days, having diaries and writings and all was uh, extremely helpful. Bill, how important is character? How important is our values? Uh, if an upstanding character were a sufficient condition for presidential greatness, Jimmy Carter would rank number one. <laughs> but it's not, and Jimmy Carter doesn't. On the other hand, if, if uh, a flawed personal character would disqualify you from becoming a great or at least a very accomplished president, then we would look, we should look, less highly on Lyndon Johnson than we do. But Lyndon Johnson was one of those essential presidents. I'm not sure where you'd rank on the greatness, but Lyndon Johnson accomplished something that almost nobody, as president, that almost nobody else could have. And that is, he was the president who guided the country to the end of the Jim Crow system of segregation. And when I say it had to be Lyndon Johnson or somebody very much like him, it had to be a southerner. It had to be a southerner to tell the South the time has come to enter the 20th century. Now there was an odd aspect to this, because it would require a Southern president to end the system of Jim Crow segregation. But a Southern president could not be, a, certainly a Southerner could not become president until the system was ended. That is more precisely, a Southerner could not come through the front door of the White House. Johnson came in through the side door through the death of John Kennedy. But if Kennedy was the one who introduced the Civil Rights Bill of 1963, but 
it really requires a stretch of the imagination to think that Kennedy could have brought it into law. It required somebody like Lyndon Johnson. And people who know Lyndon Johnson, people who read Robert Caro's accounts of Lyndon Johnson, know that Johnson was not the most admirable individual, not somebody you would necessarily like your daughter to marry. You know, he was an earthy individual. He was rough. He was crude. He was very ambitious. But he accomplished this great thing. So I don't know where I stand on this question of is character, is some kind, I mean, at first of all, I'm not even sure how I define character for these purposes. The other thing is, the last thing I would say on this is, I think we mislead ourselves a little bit to consider presidents on sort of a single measure of greatness. Certain presidents accomplish certain great things. They may fall down entirely in other respects. So, you know, as much as you might dislike Lyndon Johnson for his Vietnam War policy, you have to give him credit for civil rights. Richard Nixon was one of the deep strategic thinkers in the White House of the 20th century. And Nixon allowed the opening to China, the recognition that China was a, a great power that needed to be dealt with. The whole Watergate thing is going to keep him from becoming great. So rather than rank them on who's the greatest, who's the next, let's look at what they accomplished, give them credit where credit is due, criticize where criticism is due. So I risk my case. Whatever we think of the presidents, we have a great group of presidential historians. <laughs> Let's thank them all for a terrific, you, terrific conversation. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, Bill.